Six Flags Great Adventure in Jackson, New Jersey is one of the largest amusement parks in the world. The theme park itself spans 160 acres, and then you have the 350 acre Wild Safari Animal Park plus a separate Hurricane Harbor water park next door. This is one of my pseudo home parks, as the 4 hour drive is just on the fringe of what I consider to be a day trip. And one thing is for certain, no matter the weather, rides will be running. Great Adventure runs their coasters in conditions that no other park would dare to. Find out everything you need to know about this theme park in this review. Great Adventure originally opened in 1974 as a much different place. The original entrance was over by Runaway Mine Train, and it's really bizarre to think that was once the front of the park. Back then, the park had a greater emphasis on themed areas than thrill rides. In 1977, the park was purchased by Six Flags and renamed Six Flags Great Adventure. But the park started growing like wildfire, adding several different thrill coasters throughout the 1980s. But park attendance plummeted after two devastating accidents, and the park almost closed. The first was the Haunted Castle Fire in 1984 that killed eight teenagers. This horrific accident led to new fire safety laws for fun houses and dark rides. The second was in 1987 when a girl fell off lightning loops, which was an arrow shuttle loop. The girl accidentally sat on top of the restraint, and this led to improved safety standards for coasters across the chain and country. The park's fortunes changed over the next two decades as Six Flags invested heavily in coasters, and that's still the bread and butter of the park today. Great Adventure has 14 different roller coasters. The lineup is very heavy on the thrill coasters, featuring the world's tallest one in King Ka, a contender for the world's best wood coaster in El Toro, a brand new RMC in Jersey Devil, and five different B&Ms. Now, Great Adventure is the second highest attended Six Flags park in the chain, and one of the top five highest attended seasonal theme parks in North America. One of the biggest factors is the park's location. It's in one of the most densely populated areas. It's easily accessible for any city in New Jersey, and just one hour from both New York City and Philadelphia. However, the immediate area around Great Adventure is not as developed as you may expect. There aren't many restaurants outside of a few fast food joints, although there is a new development being built just down the road. Even more surprising is the fact the closest hotel is roughly 20 to 30 minutes away. You'd think overnight accommodations won't be closer to this park, because Great Adventure can easily be a multi-day destination. While it is possible to ride all the coasters in one day, you're going to need some luck, and to also visit on the right day. This park can get absolutely slammed. My favorite times to visit are the weekends before Memorial Day, the non-Fright Fest fall days, and holiday in the park. All three of these times have low crowds. The spring and fall dates are the most rides operational, but one or two coasters may be closed due to staffing. Holiday in the park has the shortest wait times, crowds heavier on families, and beautiful light displays. But you're going to have some major rides closed guaranteed, most notably El Toro, King Da Ka, and Medusa. I strongly recommend Holiday in the Park if you're within driving distance of Grey Adventure, but it's hard to recommend the event for those who rarely visit Grey Adventure, given how the Intamins are guaranteed to be down. I also strongly recommend the Power Hours events introduced in 2021. These are separate ticketed events that are basically ERT sessions on all the major coasters. This is the best way to marathon this park's coaster collection and accumulate a ton of night rides. And several of this park's coasters get much better at night because of their placement far away from the midway. The number one time to avoid Great Adventure though is Fright Fest. It is the busiest time of year. Lines are horrifically long. The crowds can get quite rowdy as the evening progresses. And I don't even think the haunts themselves are particularly strong. Summer days are a mixed bag. Weekends are usually busy, but you can sometimes get lucky on weekdays. If the park is packed, you can pay nearly $100 a day for a flash pass skip the line system. I think gold is the most cost effective level if you go this route. Moving on to the operations, they're a mixed bag. Some rides have super efficient operations. The poster child for this is Nitro. That crew can routinely run three trains without stacking. Seeing that crew in motion is a work of art. El Toro's crew also moves fast, as long as there isn't any larger guest trying to ride. That is one of the least accommodating rides in the industry. Three that tend to have slower operations are Medusa, Green Lantern, and Superman Ultimate Flight. 
The latter two can get lengthy waits, and they're the two coasters I recommend a first timer starting with if you're trying to get on every single coaster in a single day. Medusa will often stack three trains, but its secluded location means it's less likely to have a bad wait unless it's a super busy day. If you want an El Toro marathon, hang there first is a good idea. It's almost always a walk-on for the first hour of the day, and I've routinely been able to stay on the train. Just know they sometimes need to front load the train at the start of a cooler day, but after a few cycles you can typically sit anywhere. The two rides I do not recommend starting with are King Ka and Jersey Devil. I rarely see these two rides ready to go at park open. The most polarizing thing about this park's operations is the loose article policy. Several rides do not allow bags on the ride platform, so you need to purchase a $1 locker valid for up to two hours. This policy is seen on the major rides at multiple Six Flags and Cedar Fair parks. What's unique with Great Adventure is that several rides do not allow you to bring anything in your pockets. This includes El Toro, King Da Ka, Zumanjaro, Joker, and Jersey Devil. You must put everything in a locker, essentially turning these rides into upcharge attractions because pretty much everyone has a wallet and a cell phone. There aren't metal detectors, but there is a security guard stationed at each entrance who will interrogate you and they'll have you pat down your pockets. And this is what they do as proof. And it's not worth trying to sneak something in because along with violating the park rules, you are kicked out of line if you're spotted with something. The best part about this park's operations is the weather policy. Most parks have minimum operating temperatures. Great Adventure scoffs at those. As long as Rise is physically able to run, they will try to run it. Now rides may run slower in these conditions. I wouldn't be surprised if they have the record for the most valleys. El Toro has stalled multiple times during morning testing, and they've also valleyed Nitro and Jersey Devil. But remember, most other parks exercise caution in bad weather. Great Adventure just dispatches and prays. Pretty much all the B&Ms will run in sub-freezing temperatures. It's one of the most comical parts about Holiday in the Park. Even these super reliable rides get cranky in those conditions but they run more often than they don't. But it's not just the cold, it's also the wind. There was a day in 2021 with 50 mile per hour wind gusts. Nitro nearly valleyed, but they still opened their hypercoaster. King Daka is the one that will definitely close in high winds. Then Joker and Jersey Devil can also close if it's both super cold and windy. Rain is trickier. On one hand, most rides will run in the conditions and lines will be minimal. On the other hand, the park will sometimes use rain as an excuse to close the park early. Again, the one ride that will likely close in the rain is King to Ka, which is the policy with any intimate accelerator. Now let's talk about the general appearance of the park. I think it looks decent. I like the pond on the back border of the park, and several sections of the park are nicely wooded. Each section of the park is advertised as a themed area, but the theming is super light. It's about on par with the other Six Flags parks. My favorite area though is the Golden Kingdom. It is shocking this area used to be a parking lot because you really feel teleported into the jungle. Navigating this park can be annoying. Not only is it massive, but it has some egregious dead ends. The park layout basically forms a giant T. You have dead ends by Nitro and King Daka, and it's particularly frustrating when the wild walkway connecting the Golden Kingdom and Plaza del Carnival is closed. It's 50-50 if this pathway is open. And if it isn't, your walk between El Toro and King Daka will take even longer. Moving on to the ride lineup, the roller coasters are the star, especially if you love thrilling ones. El Toro is the most popular coaster amongst enthusiasts and what I consider to be the best ride in the park. This rare Intamin prefabricated wood coaster features some of the best sustained ejector airtime of any coaster. The super steep first drop, first two camelbacks, and the rolling thunder hill all catapult you from your seat for a few seconds at a time. I don't rate this coaster as high as some for reasons I talk about its own review, because while those aforementioned four moments are as good as any moment on any coaster, the middle section and finale are just okay to me. And definitely ride this one in the back. It is a crime to deprive yourself of that first drop. Jersey Devil Coaster is the newest coaster. The world's tallest, fastest, and longest single rail coaster is very seat dependent. I think it's the weakest RMC if you're in the front or middle of the train, but if you get the back, you get some very strong ejector airtime, particularly in the first drop and camelback. The inversions are excellent in any row though, 
offering great hang time. The finale doesn't have the same punch as the first half, but ever since the mid-course trim was disabled, it is given decent airtime as long as you're in one of the ends of the train. However, you can't be guaranteed to sit there. This ride is a moving platform. Seating requests in this one are hard to accommodate if they're even accommodated at all. You can try to position yourself accordingly for the row you want, and I have an entire review in this ride as well. King Da Ka towers over the parking lot. This ride opened in 2005 as the world's tallest and fastest roller coaster. While Formula Rosa Ferrari World stole the speed record, Ka still has the height record. This ride is an absolute adrenaline rush. You accelerate from 0 to 128 miles per hour, or 206 kilometers per hour, in just 3.5 seconds. It is one of the world's most intense and best launches. You then spiral up and down the 456 foot, or 139 meter tall tower. The views at the top and laterals on the descent are world class. Make sure to ride up front to feel the speed to the fullest, which I talk about in its own review. Two notes about experience in Ka. First, King to Ka needs to have almost every seat filled to dispatch, so it can be tricky to wait for the front row on quieter days. Second, this ride is prone to downtime. Not only does it have the aforementioned weather issues, but it's prone to mechanical issues too. Nitro is one of Balger and Mabillard's earliest hypercoasters, but it's still a very good ride. This ride loses speed over each camelback, but the hills still deliver decent and sustained floater airtime. Then you also have that isolated setting in the woods. This is another ride where I have its own review. Batman the Ride was the park's first B&M, and while this is a cloned layout, it is still a strong attraction. This invert packs a major punch with the snappy inversions. Bizarro is being rethemed back to Medusa for the 2022 season. This was the original floorless coaster, and it's still a solid attraction with seven large inversions and a reasonably smooth ride experience. Superman Ultimate Flight was one of the earliest b and flyers. This ride is more about the grace and visuals, but the pretzel loop is one of the most intense elements of any coaster. The sustained positive Gs are unbelievable during that element. Green Lantern is the most polarizing b and in the park. The ride is super forceful and will make your legs feel like jelly. I like the ride's display of power personally, but it can be uncomfortable if you don't have the bike seat low enough and also the restraint low enough. Failure to do so can result in crotch pain and or headbanging, which can kill the experience. Joker is one of many SNS free spins in the Six Flags chain. These are short rides that do feel more like flat rides, but I like the mayhem of the flips. The park also has a few family coasters. Two of them are indoors, which make them great options during the inclement weather or if you need a break from the cold. Skull Mountain is a weird intimate creation. Make sure to ride this one in the back. The first drop delivers some surprising airtime in that car. The rest of the ride slowly meanders through the darkness to metal music, which is mildly interesting. Then Dark Knight is your standard mock wild mouse, but this one is indoors and has some Batman theming along the course, plus it's minimally braked, making one of the best wild mice out there. Then there are two outdoor family coasters. Runaway Mine Train is a decent arrow mine train. Most of the layout is scenic, but you have this shocking bunny hill at the end of the ride that delivers a very abrupt pop of ejector airtime. It feels completely out of place, but as a thrill seeker, I enjoy it. Harley Quinn Crazy Coaster is one of those Zier Tivoli coasters with an obnoxiously long train. So if you ride in the back car, you'll get some decent whip on the first two drops. Then for kids, you have the recently rebuilt and relocated Little Devil Coaster, which is an off-the-shelf San Perla Kitty Coaster. And yes, adults are allowed to ride even without a kid. Great Adventure has two main kids areas. You have the Safari Kids area over by Nitro and Bugs Bunny National Park over by El Toro. I think both areas are in dire need of a refresh. While they have a decent mix of rides for younger guests, the areas just look dated. For adult flat rides, Great Adventure has an underrated lineup. The spinning flat rides are fine. You have a cluster towards the middle of the park, plus a few others, but the newer thrill rides are the ones worth experiencing. Zoom and Jaro Drop of Doom is the most memorable because it's also the world's largest drop tower. Fixed to the side of King Da Ka, this intimate drop tower features a breathtaking view of the park. The drop may not have the power you may expect for an intimate drop tower, 
but the sheer length and speed of the plummet makes it memorable. Wonder Woman Lasso of Truth is a Zamperla Giga discovery that has the title as the world's tallest frisbee. This rides great speed, positives, and airtime on the max swings, plus it is a long cycle. Just know this is another ride that can get a lengthy weight due to its lower capacity and popularity. Cyborg Cyberspin is a ride that I seem to like more than most people. Now it's usually closed, but I've gotten rides chock full of hang time inducing flips. One of the biggest tips seems to be to ride this with a less than full gondola. Otherwise, you can get stuck in rocking purgatory and have a far tamer ride experience. Twister is the last Hust top spin in America. This one doesn't have the craziest cycle, but you still have an intense cluster of flips at the start. Sky Screamer is a familiar fun time swing ride. This one spins you faster than most and it's particularly cool during holiday in the park when you swing high above the park's lights. Lastly, you have a rare parachute tower. It's not super thrilling, but it's worth experiencing if it has a short wait due to its rarity. For dark rides, you have two. Justice League Battle for Metropolis is a fun interactive shooting dark ride. The targets are screen based, but the ride uses the DC Comics IP well. The ride is responsive, and I like the physical cutscenes in between some of the screens. Then Houdini is a rare Vacoma madhouse with a super convincing inverting effect, plus some solid theming during both the ride and the pre-show. The water rides at Great Adventure aren't the strongest in my opinion, but you have two. Congo Rapids has a pretty simple layout for a River Rapids ride, and there's only one or two rapids that can actually soak you. Then the Sawmill Log Flume, while long, is just okay on the drop department, and it rattles quite a bit down the trough. If you want something more, you have the nearby Hurricane Harbor Water Park. It's a separate ticket. I've never been there, but it looks to have a decent mix of slides, but nothing overly unique. Finally, you have the Safari. For many years, it was a separately ticketed drive through attraction before finally being added as a tram tour inside the theme park. But after the pandemic, the attraction returned to being a drive through I prefer this approach to be honest because you can take your time through the exhibits. The animal collection is incredible, and I know people who visit Great Adventure just for the safari. This attraction can easily take one to two hours if you take your time. There are still a few animal encounters inside the park over by the wild walkway though but their presence is definitely limited inside the main park. I strongly recommend a season pass to any Six Flags park, but that's especially true with Great Adventure because of how the amusement park, water park, and safari are all separate gates. Plus, you get parking included, which is a $30 expense on its own. Six Flags did recently change their season pass model for the 2022 season, so the lowest tier isn't valid chain-wide anymore. Just keep that in mind. It's also worth noting that Six Flags Great Adventure promised some operational improvements in 2022, including more single rider lines, so I'm interested to see how efficient these are. Lastly, let's talk about the food. Great Adventure has a lot of options in this department. Quite a few stands now take mobile ordering, which is a major time saver. But the best restaurant in the park is Mama Flora's in Movie Town. The cheese steaks here are incredible. This will probably anger some Pennsylvanians, but their cheesesteaks are better than any from Pat's and Geno's. So do I recommend Six Flags Great Adventure? I absolutely recommend this amusement park for thrill seekers. Few parks have a better coaster lineup. Just be careful when you visit to avoid the heavy crowds and ride closures. For animal lovers, I strongly recommend the Safari. It is the best attraction of its kind in the region. For families, I most recommend visiting during holiday in the park because of the quieter crowds and colorful lights. So those are my thoughts on Six Flags Great Adventure, one of the best amusement parks in the Northeast. What are your thoughts on this New Jersey amusement park? Do you agree it has one of the best coaster lineups in the world? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments, whether it be about the theme park, the water park, or the safari. If you enjoyed this review, I'd appreciate it if you gave this video a like, and you consider subscribing because there'll be a lot more roller coaster amusement park videos here at Canopy Coaster. Thanks for watching.